This is Russ Kenzier. Welcome to Safety News. Uh, today sitting in for Tony B is Sean Joseph. Welcome How's to the show, on? Sean. Hey, Russ. How's it going? Yeah, Gen Z, Gen X. What are you, Sean? Uh, you know, I'm probably a little ac across the spectrum. I think you can probably consider me Gen Z. Well, I'm a baby boomer, so uh, it's going to be good to get your perspective of safety matters in the news. And so uh, let's kind of get to it. Let's do it. Item number one, and I don't know if you've uh, heard about this, Sean, but uh, just this past week, New York Times reported that Halle Berry shared a video and joked about taking a big fall on stage at a charity event. Quote, I face planted. Did you, uh, do you know that? I did not know Didn't that. Didn't know that, huh? Well, she did. And uh, she said, sometimes you bust your <clears throat> A. Uh, as she posted a video of herself falling face down in front of a large audience. What I find kind of interesting is she pasted or posted a video of herself because uh, throughout the story, she actually got upset if uh, this appeared on YouTube. This, of course, is Halle Berry, uh, the actress, um, we very well date. known. Uh, but what's kind of interesting is she put this out on her social media page. As, uh, she said, hey, what happened was my dear friend, and I don't even know how you pronounce his name, Sean, too old for that, uh, invited me to speak at her charity event celebrating a wonderful organization called Looking Beyond LA that raises money for children with special needs. Uh, then that happened. She fell. The video continued as Barry was being helped up, walking to the podium. She left as she held her hand uh, to her forehead and then, of course, the crowd cheered. So um, it was kind of a weird event. Check this out. Oh. Yep, yeah, that's oh. me. Oh. You're probably wondering how I ended okay. up in this it's situation. Oh, oh, oh my God. My God. Just, just <laughs> now, this was her video. That she didn't want that is scary so and it's a little embarrassing too yeah to i mean it's look most people when they fall they they're embarrassed right i mean she's going up on the stage to accept an award and boom down she goes now it was carpeting so it wasn't too bad right. it could have been could have been really bad but yeah, she's embarrassed, you know, kind of hiding the face. And that's kind of a kind of a normal human reaction when people fall. They get, you know, embarrassed. O or if you're really hurt, you don't get up and you it's don't really shot. care about being embarrassed. Yeah. Um, but in her case, she um, you know, she as you said, she took it as a as a good sport. Um, she went on and said, Okay, if I see this on the internet, fans coming to you, Barry. Said while well, smiling and pointing at the audience. Um Looking Beyond is a charitable organization that supports and raises awareness for children with a range of special needs. So she got hurt on this step. Okay. This is what hurt her. And in fact, this is a close-up of her high-heeled shoe. You think that had anything to do with the... Uh... I think it contributed. Um, yeah, that looks think? like it's hard to walk in regardless. So yeah, I you think... You think that played a role? What's her that? shoes? You think that played a role? Her shoes? You know, I think it might have played a role. Uh, but she's allowed to wear whatever shoes she wants. Well, that's right. And the stairs got to be ready to go. Exactly. So you see these kind of unusual stairs. This is another close-up. It's it's kind of this tri-level, what's called a short flight of stairs. I don't know if you ever heard that phrase before. Okay. But there's no handrail, no guardrail. There's no visual cue. You notice the carpeting is all kind of, uh, it all kind of blends together. It's like it has a pattern. So there's no distinctive uh, edge. They rolled the carpeting over the top stair. You see that? I, yeah. Why, why is there a reason why it's over the stair versus just being at the same plane? Good question. Good question. So why do you think that is? I mean, they built this little stage to, um, you know, to I guess give people awards to stage. Uh, but they built it where that that top piece of carpeting went right over the edge of the step. Yeah. So it made it hard to see. She's not paying attention. At the stairs. She's not looking down at her feet. No. She's looking forward. She's excited. The crowd's clapping. Right? right. So she's looking straight ahead, not anticipating uh, that there's this step. Um, and so I would say the shoes, your heels played some role, but really she was preoccupied looking forward and she didn't anticipate, you know, a stair to be there. Mm -hmm. um, and so you say, well, gosh, what's the, what's the standard? 
What's the standard for stairs? And so there actually is one, ASTM, okay. American Society of Testing and Materials. Uh, standard practice for safe walking surfaces. And get a load of this, Sean. Section 7.1.1, stairways with, quote, distracting, end quote, forward or side view shall be avoided. A distracting view is one which can attract the stair user's attention. For example, advertisements, wow. door displays, or people standing on the stage clapping, you know, welcoming you as you're about to walk up the stairs. Yep. Uh, the standard goes on to talk about nosings. That's that edge with the carpeting on it mm -hmm. that we talked about. Shall be readily discernible, slip resistant, and adequately demarcated. And here's the key. Random pictorial, pictorial floral, or geometric designs are examples of design elements that can camouflage a step nosing. So looking at this edge, that nosing where the red – arrow is, needs to be demarcated, meaning you should be able to distinctly see the edges of the stairs. Because kind of imagine you're looking at this and it all looks like one blur, right? right? You follow me? I am. And I'm just, this is fascinating because, you know, before looking into the standards for the step, I'm just kind of processing what I just watched. Yeah. You know, and it started with, you know, Holly Berry, you know, mentioning what had happened, but she was called there for an event. It was supposed to be, a, you know, a joyous occasion. You could even see her walking up to the stage in a, you know, just excited fashion. Right. You're absolutely right. She's not looking down at the ground, and why would she be? She's imagine, there to imagine if she was eighty. Yeah. Oh gosh. Well, because <laughs> I swear, I what she fell, but the wall was so close to the top step. I think she may have hit her face on the side wall mm. too. So you know. This type of event takes place all the time. I don't mean an awards banquet, but falling sure. happens a lot. And, um, you know, there are standards. Right. And you say, well, how did the um, property owner design this thing? And here's the second part of the standard, Sean. Okay. What's called short flight stairs, three or few risers. You know, the part that goes up is called a riser to a step. And it says uh, avoid. Avoid using or designing elements that have short flights of stairs. Don't use them. Seems pretty clear. <laughs> Bad design. <laughs> yeah. Okay. In situations where a short flight stair or even a single step transition exists or cannot be avoided, obvious visual cues shall be provided to facilitate improved step identification. They talk about handrails, okay, nosings, yeah. tactile cues, signs, contrasts. You know, most people just say that's common sense. Sure. You know, just kind of a common sense approach. Now, I understand it's a you know, venue right. um, where people are going in and getting awards or it's, it's a stage. Sure. But you got to make it safe. We did an episode a few weeks ago where celebrities falling on and off of stage. Post Malone fell into the stage opening yeah. uh, of the floor. And and so it's a common problem for, sadly, for celebrities, yeah. this type of thing, you know, sure. falling on stage or falling off a of stage. Um, and so Halle Berry, yeah. down she went. That's that's super interesting because you're right. They're on stage. Some of them are dancing. There's just sweat on yeah. the ground. And I think a big piece of this too, I didn't really yeah. quite grasp until I watched that clip, which is, you know, a lot of times we're not looking down at where we walk. We're looking ahead or forward or to others. Right. And I just think that's that's very clear that she literally had no idea what she was yeah. walking into. I, I I know it's you know unfortunate, so I don't I don't laugh at what happened, but just the fact that it happened so yeah. suddenly. Well, so what would you say to people that say, "Well, why don't you just watch where you're walking?" You know, I think it's why don't you I, pay attention. I think it's fair advice, but I just think on a day like a practical level, we look forward, right? It, it, we should, but I also think there's some responsibility on the design. I mean, as mm -hmm. the standards you just talked about of, you know, are we, you know, letting people know? Is the host of the event, you know, alerting Holly that, right. hey, it takes a pretty quick corner, like watch your step. Yeah. I mean, you're a basketball fan. Um, you know, they when when a basketball player sweats or any moisture gets on that, that court, I mean, they're out there with the towels, you know, just – Wiping it up. Why? Because when you're playing basketball, you're not looking at the floor. Yeah. You're looking at the other players. You're looking at where you're planning on going Absolutely. and shooting. Absolutely. And so the same thing here. You don't anticipate. 
a hazardous condition. You assume everything's fine until down you go. And again, she didn't get hurt, seriously, but it could have been. It could have been a really, yeah. really serious injury. Absolutely. And, uh, and one that could have really hurt her uh, far more seriously. So that's uh, that's our first section. Number two, another interesting story. Uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day. Did you know that the California energy grid is on the brink of collapse? Not enough power. I As leaders did not push, know that. yeah, leaders are pushing in renewables, electric vehicles, you know, that kind of stuff. And, okay. um, you know, for the benefit of our audience, you are, you lived in LA, man. Yeah. Right? You were there. You were part of the, the whole LA scene for a while. That is a scary, that's scary to learn. Uh, you know, fond of California, had a great time out there, 40 million strong. Um, that is a scary update. Uh, well, what's dry? Yeah, what's dry? Their, their deal is they have mandated electrical vehicles. And so right now they don't have enough power plants. They haven't built a power plant in decades. Uh, they oppose nuclear power plants. They obviously do not like, as everybody knows, uh, fossil fuels. They're kind of big on electricity being generated from solar and, um, you know, wind power, but they're really been aggressive on pushing this, this, uh, you know, kind of eco safe uh, power, but they just don't have enough electricity. So as you see here, it says the state's grid, which is still mainly powered by fossil fuels is undergoing a major shift from natural gas and coal power to renewable power like wind and solar. Simultaneously, state officials are pushing an electrification of the economy, particularly in the transportation wow. sector through electric vehicle mandates, which Look, it's just going to put more pressure on the grid. If you don't, if you have a finite amount of energy, yeah. no new energy being produced, the grid is already stressed. So people are not going to be putting gasoline in their cars. They're going to be putting electricity in their cars. And so the grid's going to get stressed e even more. Sure. And so it becomes this kind of downward spiral to the point where people may just not have energy. Um, you know, the distribution side, a lot of people take for granted that, you know, all these big power cables that you see strung across the landscape. Well, they provide a really, really important role yeah. in getting the energy from the power distribution centers to the, your home, to your business. Mm -hmm. But get a load of this, Sean. The state's plan involves goals to slash greenhouse gas emissions by 85 percent, which is huge. Cut cut oil usage by 94 percent. I mean, that's that's basically everything. <laughs> right. I mean, just get rid of it. Uh, and deploy more solar and wind capacity over the next two decades. Well, good luck. That just doesn't work real well. We just don't have efficiencies in that in, in that sector of of energy production. The energy, you know, is still dependent on fossil fuels. But this plan, the state of the state has really had this aggressive plan to overhaul the energy system. Uh, came three months after a top California environmental agency moved forward with a rule requiring that wow. all new vehicle sales have to go to electric and. Okay. So. so question for you. So we've already seen, right, some of the, the data or the disconnect between making this shift towards a certain type of vehicle and there being fundamental issues with the grid. Right. So now, right, with those projections, first question is, do you think even of the wildest scenarios that that's doable, that's no. feasible? Okay. Obviously not. Obviously, it's not doable. I mean, don't forget, California is a state that just within recent history has had rolling blackouts, rolling brownouts. They just don't have enough energy. It's a huge state, a lot of people, right? Um, a lot of industry that demands energy. And so it's it's easy to say, well, we're just going to go ahead and get off of fossil fuels. Well, how, you, how do you really do that? I mean, the story goes on to talk about in 2021, the most recent year that they have for data for wind and solar only accounted, Sean, for 25% of their total electricity. Wow. That's it. So 75% of the energy that they depend on comes from fossil fuels. Yeah. And so if you just look at the data, the numbers, um, they've got a problem. And they, they're, they're, they're running into, they're going to drive right off of a cliff. And the final statement talks about 19% of new car sales in California were zero emission vehicles. Um, but that's a far cry from, don't they have the most cars of any state in the country? By the numbers, yeah, that would be my estimation. They produce a lot of cars. They drive a lot of cars. Yeah, so well, so that's the, that's really interesting you brought that up. So last, uh, you know, maybe last four months or so, I was in New York, never a need for a car. But when I was in California, I mean, when I was visiting my girlfriend, it was a two-hour drive right. to, you know, uh, L.A. to Orange County. 
So that's true. I mean, just the the amount of vehicles out there, the distances that you're driving, the population density, the amount of emissions in certain areas. It's a really interesting place, I think, for this exact problem. Uh, yeah, so interested to see what, yeah, what and happens here. And, and it really does kind of trickle down, no pun intended, to you know, a bigger problem. It's a big burden. Uh, there's a lot of safety-related issues related to this because we depend so much on electricity as just part of our daily life. Yeah. Um, and so the story goes on to talk about how, you know, it's starting to get a lot of pushback. Um, people don't want to be forced to buy expensive electric vehicles. And as you know, I drive an electric car, so I'm, I got a dog in the hunt. I think electric cars are cool, but I understand not everybody can afford them. Uh, the reality is internal combustion engines are the way people get around. I'm, that's the car you had, right? Mm-hmm. That's what you drove. So, um, you know, we put more demand on the grid. The grid's going to fail and uh, we're going to have a whole bunch of problems. In fact, if you look at storage capacity, that's another big problem. You can have wind power, you can have solar power, but um, all right, the wind does. What, what do you do when the wind doesn't blow? What do you do when the sun's not shining? It's cloudy. You know, of course, LA, California is pretty sunny, but you can't store that energy. Sure. It's dark out. Yeah. And the wind's not blowing. Yeah. You don't have electricity. It's just that simple. Yeah. Um, solar panels have to um, have to have you know sunlight on them. There's limited you know, capacity for batteries, and they're extremely expensive. And um, you know all the mining that goes into lithium and those other materials that go into batteries is strictly prohibited. In fact, California had one of the largest rare earths mines that they closed down a number of years ago. So we get it all from China. Yeah. It's all coming from China. So we're uh, we're just facing this massive energy crisis, or they are, that um, is really going to crush them, really going to crush them. And so, anyhow, if you build all these new transmission lines, and 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 it, which are ex- extremely expensive, and you have to go through all this red tape of environmental regulations, permitting, it just takes forever. Yeah. And some of these places that have renewable targets that are, you know, 2035, 2040, 20, the year 2045, that's not that far away, and there's just no way to get there. There's just no way to get there. Uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, look at all the areas by which we are just our modern civilization takes for granted. Water. You can't put on the faucet in your home and get water mm-hmm. unless you have electricity because all the pumps that pump the water from the storage facilities to your house are right electrified. Absolutely. Absolutely. Food supply. You're not going to get food. No electricity. No electricity. No water. No electricity. No food. Because you have to refrigerate food, right? Mm-hmm. To transport food. Um, heating, air conditioning. Imagine what it's like not having heating or air conditioning. Refrigeration. Schools. Schools are closed. No electricity. No lights. No computers. Work stoppages for the same reason. Transportation. Can't run cars and trucks because the street lights aren't working, Right. Internet stoppage, road closures, everything falls apart. Our society as we know it would collapse. And California is running headfirst into a massive safety crisis that will absolutely destroy. I don't think they'll do it, but it would destroy their economy. I mean, imagine telling people, hey, sorry, there's no electricity. That's like they do in Cuba. Sure. Hey, we're out of electricity today. Sorry. Um, Who wants to live like that? For a pipe train, you know? I mean, just yeah. the, just the odd moment, maybe one or two times a year, where we have yeah. a power outage for you know ten minutes. That seems like a full day. Well, it is. And think it, about that. It's just a really powerful reminder in that short window how much we truly rely on every activity daily, uh, where electricity plays a role. In you, fact, most people take it for granted. Sure. Absolutely. Most people take the luxuries of a modern civilized world. For granted, sure. water, food, refrigeration. I mean, imagine like here in Texas when the power goes out for a couple of hours, people are panicking. If it's out for a day, it's, oh my God, we're, the world's coming to an end. Right. But imagine having permanent power outages. You just don't have enough capacity. And there, you know, it's not like you just build a power plant tomorrow. It, it'll take a decade right. to get a power plant literally from design, you know, construction to operational. And um, and so, yeah, the uh, great state of California, state that you uh, lived in for a number of years, is head on running into a massive uh, safety uh, crisis by their own by their own means, by their own means. It's unfortunate. Yeah, Definitely, but, you know, 
wish everyone in California well, but this is pretty eye opening. Yeah. Um, it just seems like there's two countervailing forces, like like an idealistic view and and some pretty clear data that's showing. Yeah. We're pretty far from that being the case. Long way to go. Yeah. Long way to go, which of course takes us to our next subject. We have number three today. This came from last week. Fox News reported that face masks for COVID made little to no difference in preventing the spread of COVID. Latest scientific review finds. Did you know that? I did not know that. Yep. Research suggests that the Centers for Disease Control's claims of mask effectiveness may have been exaggerated. Now that's it's a big so topic. So let's kind of unpack that a little bit. There's different kinds of masks, right? What kind of mask did you wear? So I had a cowboy's mask. Um, <laughs> there was a point <laughs> where I wore the N95. <laughs> okay. Did you, use, <laughs> did you have the N95? I did for a short period. And then um, something a little less... Uh, for me, I actually did think, you know, it wasn't comfortable. So unless there was an absolute need or it was required, I would. Um, in traveling in the airports, I'd wear an N95. Right. Um, yeah, locally, just a small mask. It's like cute well, designs on well, it. Well, most too. people wore the cloth right. mask. And I'd like to say, because we did a lot of stories about this on the radio show, but, you know, wearing a cloth mask, let's say, you know, putting up a, um, what would you say, a um, sock on your face, fabric. Um, what is that going to do? Well, the coronavirus is microscopic. So that's like having a chain link fence around your yard to keep mosquitoes out. It's going to go right through it, just nonstop. Now you exhale into the sock right. <laughs> and you breathe that in. So there's detrimental effects to you because you're breathing your own exhale there, bacteria, fungus, just bad stuff happens. But the uh, story was kind of fascinating because it, 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 of course, was put up by Dr. Walensky. You remember her, right? Yes. What? She always has that look, doesn't she? <laughs> what? What happened? Centers for Disease Control said that uh, there's been a lot of turns and twists throughout this COVID pandemic. And after initially claiming face coverings weren't necessary, the CDC changed course in April. Calling on all Americans, even children as young as two years old, to mask up. Mask up, put your sock on. Uh, that September, CDC Director Dr. Robert Redfield said during a Senate hearing meeting that, quote, face masks are the most important powerful health tool we have, end quote. Even suggesting that they might offer more protection than any other f form of Antibiotics or um, – That's a pretty strong yeah, medical treatment, um, the vaccine. Again, that's your Centers for Disease Control. Anyhow, new scientific review led by 12 researchers from esteemed universities around the world. That's a red flag. Not certain what esteemed universities mean. But anyhow, they suggest that, well, the widespread masking had done little to nothing to curb the transmission of COVID-19. Little to nothing. So we all put masks on, N95, KN95. You, you know the difference between an N95 and a KN95? Nope. Made in China. KN95 is the is the N95 or K, yeah, KN95 is the, the Chinese version. Works pretty similar, but that's a surgical mask. And so they did better, but they were not really effective in terms of curbing the, the spread of the virus because viruses spread. And a lot of people don't realize this, but a lot of people that got COVID never got it because of breath. They got it from touching mm -hmm. or they get it through their eyes. There's so many ways to transmit viruses. It's it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect everybody. I mean, eventually everybody on the planet is going to contract it and the healthy will have less problems and those who are ill or older or overweight or have a medical condition will be more prone to the disease. So where we are, Sean, where we are is CDC, after years of making everybody mask up, said, eh, wah, wah, wah. well, it really didn't work. By the way, there are people still walking around with masks on. We're going to do a story about that next. Yep. But it uh, didn't work. Question for you. Didn't work. How, how does 
How is there such a discrepancy in data and opinion uh, on a subject that should be fairly straightforward to test? And so what I mean by that is you've got one side saying this could be more safe, right, or effective than vaccines. And then, right, other data that suggests, well, it may not help much at all. So what is the consumer, right? When I'm watching this, right. when I'm watching uh, the news with my parents, how do we know how to interpret what's being said to you us? You don't. You don't. By the way, that's what this show is all about. We take what the mainstream media puts out as news and we do a deep dive. We talk about it. We, we talk about, well, what's going on with these masks? Um, I don't know if you saw the news story. This is, this is, <laughs> this came out, Yahoo News, COVID-19's lasting impact. Less attractive people wear masks more often than other studies. Oh, Did you That's hear that? Just... Did you hear this? Yeah, yeah it's a, the news study. According to a recent study published in Frontiers in Psychology, our results cons consistently demonstrated that self-perceived unattractive individuals were more willing to wear a mask as they believed it would Benefit their attractiveness, the authors noted of the report. Study uh, went on to say that, quote, our findings suggest that mask wearing can shift from being a self-protection measure during the COVID-19 pandemic, which we just learned doesn't work, to a self-presentation tactic in the post-pandemic era. What do you think of that? I think people have the right to test different fashion statements. I'll just say... You know, I think yes, yes, yes. <laughs> a mask is a fashion. <laughs> you know, today. so yeah, so I'm a single guy. You know, if if I went on a date and you know there wasn't a health risk, right? It was just purely a, a choice. I'd be a little bit uh, confused. Yeah, what would you do if you're on a date and somebody maybe met whatever you didn't know her very well, and she shows up, she's got the mask on. You know, you know, first. You know, we introduce myself, right? Uh, have conversation. At some point, I would like to understand, you know, what prompted it. Um, and, and in the case, right, as the article talked about attractiveness, you know, personally, I, I find being able to talk to somebody, you know, clearly and um, as unobstructively as possible is a real part of attraction. Um, so, so while I, I don't downplay, right, if, if people feel that way. It's their right to do so, but you're covering a good portion of your face and it makes yeah. communication yeah. hard in many ways. So this is interesting. Uh, just the, the how far this is going into, um, yeah, adapting our lives and, and just, yeah, how society is interpreting and, and going yeah. through some changes. Psychological impact. It very Yes, yeah. absolutely. Again, it went on to talk about how you know, wearing these masks and really – change people's view of themselves. Researchers emphasize that the effects of self-perceived attractiveness on the intention to wear a mask only applies to situations when people are very emotional to make a good impression. Gotcha. Think about that. So now you're wearing a mask and, you know, you see it. People are outside and they're wearing masks. Yeah. And it's now kind of this emotional crutch that if I don't consider myself attractive, I now have a crutch that I can use called a mask. Yeah. So it's kind of a virtual virtue signal. Look at me, I care. Right. But it's really don't look at me because I have bad teeth. Sure. <laughs> or w whatever whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, but that's the, the key here is the term self perceived right. attractiveness. Self perceived attractiveness is defined as individuals, self concept or beliefs about their physical appearance. For many, the mask covered expressions of negative emotions in interpersonal settings. Kind of oh, what wow. you're saying, okay? So that's – so can I just jump in there for a second? Yeah, jump in there. So that's huge, right? And, you know, I didn't get to that point of clarity until reading that. But it was kind of where I was going, which is, you know, you and I are sitting here. We're talking, right? We're talking about fun topics, right, and going into them. But some of my understanding of, of how you feel – is by literally being able to see your entire face, right? Right. I can see when you're smiling. I can see when you're mild. I can see when you're frowning. Like that's a part of the human experience and connectivity. And the mask quite literally obstructs half of your face. It's almost self-shaming. I don't want you to know me. 
to some degree. I don't want you to see me. Yeah, it's I like you're want... concealing. Right. Just the the realities that humans go through, which is, mm-hmm. you know, we have emotions. Um, we we view beauty in different ways. Um, so this is yeah, this is very very interesting. Yeah, I mean, I the last part of the study talked about what you mentioned about going on a date, blind dates. Right. Researchers acknowledged that they only studied one particular search or situation, namely job interviews, but that there are many other situations that motivate people to make good impressions, such as going on blind dates. So to your point, if you're going to an interview for a job, you wear the mask because you don't want people to see you. Well, I don't know if that's a, is that really a technique to get the job? I mean, for me, it'd be a negative. I want to see you. Absolutely. Unless you're saying I've got some disease and I don't want to cough on you. But imagine going out on a purely emotional kind of first date getting to know somebody and you don't really want to get them to know you because you're hiding behind the mask. Yeah. You know, you know? It, it, it is interesting. Um, so I had connected with a nice lady. She was in California. And, you know, she gave as a precursor that on the first date she will wear a mask. Now, at the time, this was for health reasons, but it was a very stringent, like, just so you know, this is, you know, mm-hmm. how the first date will be. It's really important to me that, like, you understand and respect that. And while I did, there was also a, a, a bit of uh, a part of me that was, you're, it's absolutely in your right to do so. But it's as if it's this, um, this default where I wasn't personally fully convinced that it was about safety. <laughs> um, it right. maybe it was maybe to a degree, but I couldn't help but have an intuitive feeling in that conversation that there was something else associated with it, um, which, you know, love and respect to her. But, but at the same time, it, it was a, it was a very important point for her that wearing the mask, especially on the first date and maybe even the first couple of dates. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think this could be really interesting well, because where we are. Yeah, it's that. This is one of the unintended consequences, especially for children. That became, or for many, the new normal. Wearing a mask is just a new normal. It, it lost its importance as it relates to the coronavirus. We now know they don't work. Right. So, if anything, people should say hallelujah, throw those things away because they didn't work anyhow. But we find that there's a disproportionately growing number of young people and probably older people as well that say, well. I, I'm dependent on it. It's my new crutch. It's kind of an emotional crutch. And um, just an interesting story. Yeah. I don't hear about that. Well, it, it is interesting. And as I, as we were talking through it, like, yeah. I've experienced some of this yeah. myself. So, yeah. Well, your generation, what can I tell you, <laughs> you kids? It's true. All right. Last subject today, Sean. AP yeah. News reports that the Super Bowl field turned into a super slip and slide. Did you hear about this story? A lot of slipping and sliding going on, man. I watched the Super Bowl, but I did not know about this. Yep. Glendale, Arizona, State Farm Field Stadium turned into a Super Bowl slip and slide. With the surface seeming to get worse as the night wore on, players from both teams had a hard time keeping their footing on Sunday, leading several to change their cleats during a game. Quote, it was like playing on a water park, Eagles left tackle, Jordan. Miliata said, State Farm Stadium has had a history. The slippery fields. Players complained about the field conditions at the BCS National Championship game, the college playoff uh, in 2010, and the same thing in the college playoff game between Alabama and Clemson in 2015. So we have a field problem. We have a condition of a professional football p- field where people are, players can and are getting hurt, so much so that they have to change their cleats. So what's going on, Sean? I mean, you're. Did you watch the game, by the way? I watched the game, uh, and hearing this story. So there's so many layers to this. Arizona, Arizona's hot. I used to live in Arizona. Um, players changed their cleats several times during the game. That in itself is a safety hazard. A lot of times, players, as you know, yeah. you're an athlete, right? Uh, you have family members that are athletes. It's 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 very important to have shoes that are broken in. Or that you have some kind of familiarity and comfort on the field itself, as opposed to wearing right. new cleats for the first time. Also, football itself is like a game that's all about dynamic movements and cuts. Um, and if a player f- quite literally felt that unsafe, and this has historically been reported as an unsafe field, like, 
you know, I, I love watching the NFL, but at times, like, when your players are telling you, like, I didn't feel safe. Yeah. And they've reported that that field didn't make them feel safe in the past. Like, how is this happening? Yeah. Well, I mean, Patrick Mahomes actually said that. Uh, he slipped while trying to make a cut. That's your point when you're making a move. But was able to gain a few more yards. Kansas City receiver Sky Moore lost his footing on a jet sweep. And running back Isaiah Pecchio even slipped during his celebration after scoring a touchdown. Now, that's really humiliating. Um, Eagles quarterback Jalen Hurts, tight end Dallas Goddard, reminding the players who change cleats to get better traction. Wow. And here's the quote. I changed my cleats, and right before the second half, wore different ones, Goddard said. Second half, you know, field was tearing up a little bit. But, you know, once again, we're playing on the same field as the Chiefs. So to justify and say, well, you know, the field's bad for me, and, um, well, it's bad for them too. It's bad in – a really bad way because that all you all you're really saying is well we're all going to get hurt yeah no the goal is not to get hurt which is kind of ironic because isn't football a game of pain infliction yeah like, well, well, I'm going to hurt you it's already kind <laughs> of assumed that there's a high chance you will get hurt yeah. and this yeah. doesn't this add to it it's kind of the game isn't it but uh, what's funny is we I did a story about this a few weeks ago February fifth oh, for those man. who are watching the show today uh, I did a program on. Are NFL football fields causing player injuries? It's a great question. Yeah. And um, and so there you have it. Another day in the world of safety. So, so let me ask, can I can I put a hypothetical at you? Sure. Let's say you're the NFL commissioner, right? And you have a focus for next year. I want to prevent player injuries, or maybe a specific type of injury mm -hmm. that's associated with turf, field, you know, some verifiable metrics. Where do you start? Well, I always like to start with standards. Let's standardize the playing field. I mean, professional soccer does that. I mean, professional soccer says you're really? going to play on grass. You can't play on turf. Oh, wow. I you know, don't like the World Cup coming to the United States, they all have to have, they all have, to have grass um, field. So you have to standardize. Okay, um, what should be the standard? Well, the standard should be whatever they define it to be. But, but let's say you're playing on a grass field this week and you're playing on a turf field next week. Every athlete should have adequate footwear yeah. for those fields. So when you say, hey, the Cowboys are playing the Giants, well, there's a special kind of cleat that the Cowboys players need to wear when they play the Giants in in, in um, New York and vice versa. Yeah. But what comes from that, Sean, is just mayhem. Different shoes, different players. Like you said, they get used to shoes. They come, shoes are a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some players will wear shoes that are really super tight, like two sizes smaller than their feet because they want that touch control. Mm -hmm. And so do you really want to put the burden on the players? My view is put the burden on the, the, the owners, the cities who own these fields and create some standardized surface, whether it's grass, whether it's turf, whatever it might be. I understand and parts of the country where there's, you know, certain places, let's say in Glendale, you growing grass is easy. It's real sunny and you get a lot of, you know, a lot of growing season. But versus say Green Bay, where it's really cold. Yeah. And but they have natural grass in Green Bay. Yeah. So they they use it. Um but it's all about standardization because if you don't have standards and everybody's on their own. And this is clearly a screw up because all these players show up in Glendale, and they've got problems. And by the grace of God, it could have been any of them. It was, you know, kind of a yeah. ACL or, well, know. And the scary thing, too, is some of those players already had lingering injuries yeah. from previous games. You know, I actually got a call number, it's probably a couple of years ago, from an attorney who wanted to hire me. He was representing several major league football players. And he says, I need to hire an expert to help me on this um, this case. I've, I'm representing three um, players and they're all hurt. Permanent injuries are gone. They're, they're not even in the NFL anymore. And I need an expert in this area. And I said, well, that, I might be able to help you, but understand there's no standards for fields. There's no standards for cleats that can be used as a basis for your, your suit. It's personal preference. And the, look, the argument is, well, you got hurt, but you know how many other players have been on this field? They never got hurt. So it must be you. Yeah. So I kind of blame you. Okay. Uh, when you watch the interview that I did with Richard Humphrey, you know, when he when I asked a question, how big of a deal is safety to the NFL owners? He's like, uh, not at all. In fact, if you complain, 
adios. I mean, it's just not important. And so uh, I guess it's a business, Sean. It's the business of football and players get injured. Oh, well, I guess we'll just go to the draft next year and find another one. And and I would hope that I'm wrong, okay? But um, from what you read and what you see and what you hear, it's a chronic problem in, in the sport. I presume it's true for other sports. But like, you know, baseball. Bas- let's use basketball. I mean, the courts are standardized, right? It's maple and absolutely after s- identical finishes, same size, and a lot of sweat directly dropping yeah. on that hardwood floor, but they can't be absorbed. Like at least turf right. or grass. But they standardize that playing field. Yeah, basketball court, baseball diamonds are for the most part standardized, right? right? Why is football different? Why is it? Why is it the wild, wild west where you go into every stadium and they're all different? Well, what makes football different than? Every other sport. Tennis is the same, right? That's a great question. I'm trying to pinpoint if there's – so this, is, this isn't this is like data-based, just a gut feel of – I think the owners hold a lot of control on you know treating their individual franchises mm-hmm. like their own business versus um, apply all standards to every team in the league like some other leagues. That would be my guess. Yeah, I would think you know if, if you're an owner of a team or the owners – and the commissioner should commission a study. We're going to go ahead and find the optimal field that we're going to standardize throughout the entire league, whatever that is, whatever the best stuff is. Is, is it grass? Is it split You know, turf? What is it? But I don't think they've ever done that. They just all do whatever they want. And so um, here we are in the wild, wild west of uh, safety. Welcome to the NFL. So, Well, I hope they do because – you know, from a fan's perspective uh, and trying to look at it from the player's perspective, if the owners invest the time, you've got a consistent, safer experience that's going to ensure the longevity and health of your players, which is only going to make them more excited to play for your mm-hmm. organization. And the fans have more reassurance that yeah. when they spend their hard-earned dollars and they take their kids or their loved ones, that they're going to be able to see their favorite players. Um and the sad, unfortunate, you know, truth that I feel like I'm seeing in a lot of sports is a lot of players are getting injured. And, you know, it, it's most importantly, it starts with their safety just as at a, at a human level. And then are owners really investing the time to figure out the problem and get it right? And it sounds like no. Well, we would, <laughs> we would welcome NFL owners or the commissioner to reach out to us and – yeah. Kind of get their view, but again, the um, the reality seems to be very different than uh, you know what we what we are told. Uh, I don't I don't know anyone that watched the game on uh, you know Super Bowl Sunday that knew that. I mean, you saw players sliding around, yeah. but I didn't know it was that bad. That at What's halftime, it, why aren't they reporting that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, at halftime they all were changing their cleats. It was that bad. Yeah, you think they somebody like they've got commentary. Like my friend and I, so I went to Austin for the game and my friend is watching the pregame commentary. Now I love the Super Bowl, but I was more interested in going out in Austin, doing some things before the game started. But it just baffles me that you've got round the clock commentary on every aspect of the game, but something that was clearly like near and dear to the players' hearts, the ones playing the game, Mm -hmm. they didn't feel safe on the field. Well, to make matters even worse is most of those broadcasters are former football players. Absolutely. Why didn't anybody pick up on this and say, "Wow, um, rep- you know the, the the reporter on the field noted that players are changing their cleats because the dangerous condition of the field." Uh, why didn't that make the news? Yeah, absolutely. Good question, Sean. So, well, thanks for joining me today. Thanks for having had, me. This uh, has been uh, yeah, this has been a lot of fun and mighty. I learned a lot. Um, yeah, hopefully I can come back. Yeah, yeah, we'll bring you back next week if you don't mind putting up with us. Let's do it. Me. Well, thanks again. This is Russ Kenzier. This has been uh, Safety News. I covered a lot of ground. And uh, until next week, we uh, always wish you a safe and and healthy day and uh, make sure your next step isn't your last step. So with that in mind, take care.